We're taking a look at the architectural side of gardening coming up. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and ways for you to expand your living space outdoors. Now, today's show, we're going to focus on architectural influences. As you can imagine, architecture in the garden is a way to create a certain continuity and harmony. In fact, a little later in the show, we'll visit with a young designer in Holland who shares with us a garden home he created and tells us how the architecture of the home and surrounding structures was both inspiring and challenging to the project. I'll show you some different styles of architecture and tell you about the gardens I designed around these homes. I think you'll find this particularly helpful if you're starting to lay out a garden of your own. Plus, safety is important to all homeowners, so a little later we'll take a look at some plants that can help you protect your investment. Right now, let's take a look at this garden I designed where the influence of architecture is a key element. This is Marl's Gate. As you can see, the home here plays an important role in setting the mood of this place. The house dates to the late 1800s and has become a favorite venue for weddings. In fact, the owner asked me to design a garden here. And brides certainly over the years have taken advantage of it when it comes to making some great wedding photographs. One of the most rewarding aspects of being a garden designer is seeing the gardens that you help create being enjoyed by so many people. Now a little later in the show, I want to share with you one of the newest additions to this garden. It's the glass house and it's full of beautiful plants. As you can see, the architecture is in keeping with the architecture of the house itself, even though this is a new structure. You know, I have to say, nine times out of 10 when I'm asked to help on a design project to create a garden, the house is already a given element in the landscape. It's already established, like here at Marlsgate. Every so often I have an opportunity to work with an entire design team on both the house and the garden together. This is ideal because the house and the garden should flow smoothly from interior to exterior. And it's always a lot easier to do things like install sprinkler systems and get the drainage right when construction is going on. Of course, the drawback here is that you're starting from scratch, a blank slate. I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy the challenge of working with an existing house on a property. You see, I can use that established element as a springboard of ideas. By looking at the style and the architecture, I can draw inspiration from these and I can transform an ordinary yard into a garden home. For example, right here at Marlsgate, the classic style of the house has been carried into the garden with such elements as piers and walls that are made of brick and painted the same color as the house. The first step to creating this extension or flow from inside to outside is dividing spaces into garden rooms. What I like to do is create a series of private spaces around a home, thereby expanding the living space outdoors. Just like interior rooms, garden rooms can contain furnishings and decorations, providing us with places to relax and entertain. So the garden home starts with the architecture of your home, and that's extended out to the boundaries of your property. Now let me give you some examples of some garden homes I've created using a variety of architectural styles. A friend of mine who's an architect designed this home for his family, and he was significantly influenced by his travels and study in Italy. He included little windows looking out onto vistas that surround the property, as well as a large covered porch, which serves as an outdoor living room. In another design, the home is situated on a river and the architecture is reminiscent to a boat. In the garden, I wanted to choose plants that would reflect movement. Ornamental grasses were ideal as they sway like waves in the wind. One of the design challenges we were faced with here at Marlsgate is the fact that the house sits on the flat delta plain. So it was important to try to match elements in the garden with the scale of the house, so height became essential. To achieve this, I suggested planting holly hedges to create an enclosed garden. And within just a few years, 
we had this striking garden space that clearly complements the home. Inside this green framework, the owner can plant colorful annuals, and he's accented the entries with climbing roses. This glass house is the latest addition. Certainly a strong architectural element in the garden, don't you think? What's wonderful about this place is that in the middle of winter you can have so much color. Just take a look at the bougainvillea, orchids of all varieties, even azaleas and camellias. Another marvelous aspect to a glass house like this is that it actually does help us blur the lines between the outdoors and the indoors, between the home and the garden. It's a garden room, and this garden room is furnished like one with tables and chairs. And just take a look at that dramatic chandelier hanging above the fountain. The sound of water, these beautiful blooms, all conspire to help us forget that it's cold outside. It's the perfect place to come in and relax on a cold winter's day, or even a rainy day for that matter. Now let's take a look at some other gardens I've designed. In this garden, the style of architecture makes you think about the passage of time. Time is another of the 12 principles of design. And here, mystery plays a role. Don't you want to wander down this path to see what's on the other side? Adding a touch of mystery is another of the 12 principles. This traditional Tudor-style home takes advantage of rustic stone, exposed timbers, and stucco. Gates play an important role in separating one garden room from the next. This low gate in the front is nearly dwarfed by this climbing rose, New Dawn. Each spring, it's covered with a profusion of bloom as it helps to visually separate the garden from the street. This attractive gate marks the entry to the fountain garden. Now, speaking of this space, let me show you a great example of extending the home outdoors. This homeowner wanted a special garden room that would make her dining room feel larger. And the addition of this fountain garden certainly accomplished this without having to renovate the house. On the other side of the house, we created a more public garden with seating and dining areas. An herb garden and fountain act as a centerpiece here. And you'll notice that we've used a great deal of paved areas in this garden. In fact, this garden home only has two spaces of lawn. You know, a lot of people are looking to alternatives to turf grasses. Even me, take a look. Over the years, as my garden has continued to evolve, I've made a concerted effort to look for ways to reduce the amount of lawn I have to care for. I've done this by creating different types of garden paths using a variety of materials, such as this gravel, or brick, or even just field stone or mulch. However, I'd have to admit that one of the most compelling reasons for me to reduce lawn is it gives me more opportunities to create beautiful flower beds like this one. However, it really goes beyond the beauty of these flowers. It's about the environment. Did you know that in America, each year, we mow over 25 million acres of lawn? That's the size of the state of Pennsylvania. If you think about the number of mowers it would take to cut this much grass, you can see it could have quite an impact on the environment. You see, more than 89 million small gasoline engines are operated in the United States each year. The reason this is such a big problem is that these gas-powered small engines aren't equipped with the same pollution-controlling devices as we have with automobiles. Of course, the good news is, in the next few years, we can begin seeing more rigorous environmental standards for lawn and garden equipment. But until then, I'm going to keep looking for ways to reduce the amount of lawn in my garden. I'll admit, reducing lawns isn't for everyone. I have plenty of friends who wouldn't trade their patch of green turf for anything. But if you're committed to a grassy lawn, please try to keep the environment in mind. All across the country, organic lawn care companies are popping up. Now, if you think that organic means that your lawn is going to be weak and substandard, think again. An organic lawn is a good solution for everyone, and so is properly maintaining your mower. Here's some tips to keep in mind when it's time to put away your lawn mower for the winter. Visit any lawn mower repair shop, and they'll tell you the best way to get the most out of your lawn mower is regular maintenance. It's amazing how just a few things can make a big difference in terms of how much you have to spend each year and the frustration you have to deal with. First, the professionals recommend that you drain all of the gasoline from the tank. You see, if any stays in there as little as 30 days, it can begin to gum up your carburetor. Now, here at the shop, they extract this with a vacuum pump, but at home, you can use a turkey baster. 
Next, it's a good idea to replace the oil. After a season of use, it's probably about time. It's better to go ahead and replace it rather than just drain it, because if you forget to fill it back up next spring, you can burn up the engine. And I've found that the best way to dispose of this used oil responsibly is to take it to a business that specializes in oil changes. Before you put your mower away, remove the spark plug. And to keep moisture from damaging the cylinder, spray in a little oil. As a last step, if you really want to get a jump on spring, bring your mower in and have the blade sharpened. By taking care of just a few of these things now, you'll be amazed at how many headaches you can avoid down the way. You probably know that Holland is an incredibly beautiful country with field after field of colorful flowers from spring to fall. What you may not know is that it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. There's approximately 1,000 people per square mile. Landscape architect Ewald Jemen certainly understands how to make the most of close quarters. He was hired by a Dutch couple to design a garden home around their city residence, but face some challenges that more and more American designers are having to deal with. Hey, Walt, I know from designing gardens that every property has its own challenges. What, what kind of challenges were you met with here? Uh, the first challenge here was the, the Great Wall. Now this wall is uh, really the back wall of a, of a development of houses. Well, I like the way you've broken it up using uh, various trees. Trees, uh, the platanus. It was necessary to camouflage uh, the wall. And you've also used some birch. Yeah. Uh, to make a contrast with the platanum. Uh, yeah, the platanus is a, is a sycamore. That's what we would call a sycamore, sycamore. in the uh, United uh, States. Uh, and I really like the way you're growing them flat against the wall. It was necessary because uh, on that point of the garden, it, it's very narrow. Yes. Uh, so we have to use those uh, narrow uh, trees. Now, I, I see a pattern here in this garden where you're using groups of four, four trees. trees yeah, yeah, always. Yeah. Four trees gives uh, structure to this garden. It makes it more dramatic. Yeah, so you've uh, used the four sycamores against the wall. Yeah, and four uh, catalpas in a square. Both in the front and the back garden. Yes, yeah, that, uh, that relates to each other. Yeah. Well, I even noticed on the table you have four small yeah, trees on there. the table yeah. in pots. Yeah. <laughs> it's it very repeats good. the square form there, also there. Yeah. Yeah. With those little tiny myrtle trees. Yeah, the myrtle trees, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Now another aspect of garden design that I really enjoy is working with color. And AWOL explains his strategy for bringing color into this garden home. You know, one of the aspects of this garden that I saw immediately was the way you've grouped colors. And each of the garden rooms has its own color theme. But the owner of, the, of this garden would like to have a very colorful garden. To make it uh, colorful, but yet uh, calm, I have to group them together in, in small borders. Yes, well, you've organized the colors in a beautiful way. How do they respond to the house or to the garden? To the garden. The blue uh, plants uh, are on the shady side of this garden. The red border reflects the, the interior. And at the end of the garden, we see the white, uh, the white flowers. So that part of the garden will still be seen at the evening. You've also used a lot of color in containers. Yeah, uh, I like that because on different times in the year you, you can make an accent with, the, with those potted uh, yes. plants. In Respond the container. to the season. Yeah, uh, in the uh, summertime you use annuals, in the springtime you use uh, bulbs, uh, spring, spring bulbs. I like in the front the way you've taken those really bright orange sonic impatience yeah. And, and put them next the to the brick. Piece. They work uh, very well with uh, the brick uh, of a house. Of course, they're, they make, they're also an accent. Uh, yes, a uh, very bold uh, accent, uh, it's uh, nice. Uh, it says, here is the entry to the home. That it would otherwise not be clear, <laughs> That's right. I think. So as you can see, color is very important to a garden home. Let me show you two plants that can bring great color to your garden in early fall. The first is a classic, the garden mum. These are from the Prophet series a line of great performers that will come back year after year in the garden if planted in full sun. To keep them in tip-top shape, I usually wait until early summer and then just pinch back the tips of the stems so that the plants get green and bushy. And when fall rolls around, garden mums show off like this variety called Patricia. Now color is certainly the main attraction to planting these guys, Gerbera daisies. 
Wow, that's a cheerful bloom that's hard to beat. In the past, a lot of gardeners have complained about growing Gerber daisies because of powdery mildew. But the improved genetics of this line by the flower fields helps make them more disease resistant. Now the key to success with any plant susceptible to powdery mildew is to allow plenty of air circulation around the foliage and avoid overhead watering late in the day. Our homes are probably our single most valuable investment, which is another reason why creating beautiful living spaces outdoors around our homes is important. But did you know that an attractive garden can also help protect your home? Hank Bruno of Callaway Gardens shows us some plants that are ideal for protecting our homes and all the effort we put into our flower beds. Perhaps you live on a corner lot and the neighborhood children just have to cut across, or your dog likes to dig in the wet, cool soil beneath your picture window. There are any number of places that we might use some plants that will protect the bed or the landscape from those intrusions. If your home garden has a corner like that, there are a number of species that you might be able to use to correct that situation. The most obvious, of course, is barberry. Barberry is a well-armed, small shrub with small leaves that takes pruning tightly or hedging the way other plants don't. So you can use, in this case, to keep people from cutting across a corner of a, of a sidewalk to keep the pedestrian traffic where you want it. Use a small hedge of barberry. If you have a little bit bigger room, there are many hybrids of holly that, that are also well armed. Uh, the Ilex cornuta or the Chinese hollies are the most um, thorny perhaps. Uh, some of those also have smaller leaves and can take more tight pruning and, and shearing um, to keep them in a smaller space. And another plant would be the quince. Japanese quince is also a nice flowering plant in the early spring that has the elements of protection that we're looking for. So if you're trying to keep intruders away from the house or away from trampling on your landscape, think about some of these options in terms of, of shrubs with thorns on them. Hank offered some creative solutions for protecting your home and your flower beds, which reminds me of another way to be creative in gardens of all sizes, and that's with containers. As you probably know, I'm a big advocate of container gardening because you can get a big look with a little space. Just look at the splash of color these containers provide. Now today's show is about architecture in the garden. So let me show you a container where I used a plant with strong architectural qualities. This container uses a variegated golden edged yucca as a tall and spiky element. You see yuccas make great architectural features in both containers and in the garden. I really like the way these plants make natural candelabras when they bloom. But be careful when you plant a yucca in the garden because once it's happily established, it's often difficult to remove. Also in this container is a coleus from the stained glass work series called Kiwi Fern. Here I'm using it as a round and full element, but in other containers I've used coleus as a tall and spiky plant. I'm also using geranium happy orange and salvia picante salmon at mid-height. And cascading out of the composition, we find this perky yellow calabrocoa. Now another way to incorporate architecture into your containers is by adding climbing plants, which can grow on trellises or lattice. And you might even think about mounting containers on fences or the sides of buildings to add visual interest. Which is why I wanted to bring you into my workshop and share with you a window box design I came up with. Now this is for a traditional styled home. And what I like about window boxes is that they can transition throughout the seasons. Now this one is made of eastern red cedar. You can see the model here that hasn't been painted yet. I like using eastern red cedar because it's a long lasting and durable wood. You can also use Spanish cedar, cypress, or certainly redwood. One of the great things about window boxes is that they can serve as a beautiful accent to the architecture of your home. And the contents can transition from season to season. Now with this design, you'll see I have the bracket and the box wedded together. This is just easier for me to mount a window box if the bracket's in place. Now for this particular model, if I'm attaching it to a wooden house, I would just use wood screws here and at the back of the window box. Or if the house is brick, use masonry screws. Now take a look on the inside of the box here. I want to point out a couple of things. 
the base or bottom is slatted and that's to encourage good drainage. And one of the things that you need to know is that I use a plastic liner inside these window boxes. I'll use a thick or heavy plastic, sheet plastic, and you can just staple it around the top edge of the box and then make sure you punch holes in the bottom before you put your soil in to ensure good drainage. You see this plastic liner really enhances its longevity. If you go to all the trouble to create a beautiful window box like this, you want it to last for a long time. So remember, start with a durable wood, make sure that you use a liner on the inside, and for the winter, take out the soil and the liner so air can circulate through, and then you're ready to start again in the spring. And of course, painting a window box will make it last longer as well. And as you can see here, I've painted this one a dark traditional green. Now I started this design on paper, did a drawing like this, and had a carpenter friend actually make them. Now you can have custom window boxes made for your house, or you can buy them pre-made at your local garden center. Window boxes can provide a great look to the facade of a house or a building. In the fall, a window box can be planted, or even just filled with gourds and winter squash for a festive look. You can also fill these same boxes with flowers in other seasons, like tulips in the spring. Now the main thing to remember about all containers is to be creative and just follow the simple container recipe of something tall and spiky, plants that are round and full, as well as those that cascade or spill over the edge. Now this same recipe can apply to an indoor combination. Take a look at some of these ordinary winter blooming house plants. When combined, they can create a dramatic effect perfect for holiday decorating or just bringing a bright spot into your home during the cold dark days of winter. Now the tall and spiky plant that I'm going to start with is this beautiful variegated dracaena. Just look at this foliage, isn't it spectacular? Now for the round and full elements of this composition, I'm going to use the cyclamen. Just look at the blooms and its beautiful marbled leaves. I'm also going to use a pink calancho. Then as a final touch, I'm going to use this little cascading plant. This is fig ivy to spill over the edge of the container. Just look at its tiny leaves. All of these plants will go in this long basket that resembles a window box, an indoor window box. And as you can see, I've lined the inside of it with some plastic. All I have to do is drop in the plants and then tuck a little moss around the top just to finish it off. And I'll have a beautiful arrangement for months. This idea of architecture in the garden isn't a new idea. In fact, Thomas Jefferson was a strong proponent of combining both architecture with the gardens he designed. Just one of the many reasons I've always been interested in the history of Jefferson. Few people realize that Thomas Jefferson designed serpentine walls, both an efficient and beautiful way of using materials. These one brick thick walls are amazingly self-supporting because of the curvilinear form they take. Walls are an important component to the garden home, whether they're natural or man-made. You see, walls are what give us privacy in the garden and also help us to break the garden into small rooms and manageable spaces. A few key points to keep in mind from today's show. Garden homes are made of garden rooms, and garden rooms are unique spaces that surround our homes that allow us to expand our living space outdoors. The architecture of a home can be the inspiration behind the design of a garden. So remember to look closely at the style of your home before you launch into planning and planting. And remember that containers and window boxes are great ways to bring the architecture of your home and your garden together. Also in this show, we took a look at lawns, managing them using organic methods and reducing them. Now I'm just finishing up this arrangement by tucking in some moss. I'm mainly just trying to hide the edge of the plastic containers. This will be a beautiful addition to a kitchen or in a bright sunny window. I hope in today's show you found some ideas that you can use in your garden home. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. In this show, we're going to take a look at some spectacular urban gardens and take some of the best ideas from them and apply them to our own garden homes. We'll be inspired by Chicago's Magnificent Mile, see why New York's so great in the winter, and an English garden will open your eyes on ideas about focal point and scale. I hope you'll join us.